Thank you, Madam Morani. Mr. Davies. Mr. Curtin, just briefly, hearing that last bit of police officers from obviously a reputable source, punch someone in the stomach that has his arms held and elbow him down to the ground, uh, does that, uh, is that an example of the kind of successful security that you seem to be testifying about? Um, I certainly think that that would lie in the category of um, regrettable um, defects, um, which I um, spoke of. But on that particular incident, uh, as I uh, recall um, the uh, publicly reported um, media story, uh, there were at least allegations, so they would be worthy, I uh, think, of uh, further inquiry. Uh, that that individual um, may, in fact, uh, have been denied accreditation um, to the summit, that he might more appropriately at, uh, leave, uh, lay in a category called citizen journalist, posting stories to uh, the Guardian website, uh, if I recall um, correctly, uh, and um, what uh, the police officers were following by way of procedures, um, what information they were acquiring, uh, is really beyond my professional mm -hmm. competence. But I will point to a, a larger issue because often Actually, so I don't want to point to a larger issue. I'm, I'm, I have limited time. But even if that person did not have accreditation, the penalty for not having proper accreditation is not a punch in the stomach and an elbow to the back of the neck. Surely you're not suggesting that, are you, sir? Uh, no, I'm not. I'm okay. uh, suggesting that for um, uh, other categories of uh, individuals associated with the summit, uh, there were uh, regrettable defects. Yes, that's certainly a regrettable defect, I would argue. I agree with you. Uh, Mr. Lepp, what did the police officer say to you when they wakened you that morning in the gym? You alluded to that. I want you to tell the committee exactly what the police said to you. Okay, I apologize ahead of time for my language, but uh, I was kicked in the ribs and the officer said, uh, uh, wake the fuck up, you fucking piece of shit. And uh, you mentioned gun uh, point. You were, can you tell the committee uh, briefly when you were awakened, what you, what's the first thing you saw when you opened your eyes? Uh, the first thing, I'm not, I'm not very good with weapons, so um, excuse my description, but I, the first thing I, I woke up to was a rather large weapon pointed directly into my face uh, upon being kicked awake. So I kicked awake and there's a gun butt barrel pointed in my face. Okay, now I want to back up a bit. You, you commented that when you first got to Toronto and you came in from the airport as you approached the University of Toronto gym, you said you were met by some officers who came up onto the curb and you talked about them searching through your, your, your property. I think you made a reference to them reading your, your, through your, scrolling through your, your text messages on your phone. Is that correct? That is correct. They read through all my emails, my text messages, and uh, asked me what my phone number was so they could look after it. Were you under arrest at that point? No, I was not. I was being held, though. Did they give you any indication of why they were uh, seizing your property and reading your, your private emails? Uh, no, they said they were just doing security checks. Okay. Um, now, you also mentioned, Mr. Lepp, a, a death threat, that you heard a death threat issued when you are in detention. Can you tell us what you heard? Um, there was a young man myself who asked for water, and the police officer, I, I don't know, maybe had a hard day, but he said, uh, he said, shut the fuck up, you fucking French piece of shit. You're lucky there's cameras here. Otherwise, I'd send you home to Montreal in a body bag. Okay. Um, now, Mr. Uh, Pakin, I also looked at your tweets that day, and uh, I want to put this to you. You wrote that night on June 26th, we must make a distinction between the thugs who broke store windows and torched cop cars and the very reasonable citizens who just wanted to remind the authorities that the freedom to speak and assemble shouldn't disappear because world leaders came to town. I have lived in Toronto for 32 years, have never seen a day like this. Shame on the vandals and shame on those that ordered peaceful protesters attacked and arrested. That is not consistent with democracy in Toronto G20 or no G20. Can you expand on that? What, what, what was in your mind when you wrote those words? I'm not sure. That requires much expansion. I think that pretty much sums it up. I, I could not help but be um, impressed by the... Um, I, I've seen a lot of protests in my time. I'm in journalism almost 30 years, and I've seen hundreds of demonstrations in Toronto from everything from uh, people trying to get more money out of governments to nuclear freezes to, I mean, everything you can imagine. And uh, you know, I think by this point I know a violent, out-of-control protest when I see one, and I think I know a peaceful protest when I see one. This was Saturday night. There were, it was three hours, four hours into it. There were people sitting on the street. It was pouring rain. The numbers were dissipating because it was pouring rain. Everybody was wet. It did not seem to have any of the elements of something about to explode. Quite the contrary. It was winding down. And it just seemed at that point that uh, 
the reaction of the police force was not warranted by mm -hmm. the conditions of the time. And you asked uh, who specifically gave the order to clear the street. Was that decision made on site or by higher authority? Uh, do, do you to this day as a journalist, I guess, who's used to asking questions, do you have an answer to those questions, Mr. Pagan? Uh, I don't. You ask, does the Toronto Police have any evidence of dangerous acts from those demonstrators that forced them to act that way at that time? Again, some months later, do you have any answer to that question today? I, I did put that question to Police Chief Bill Blair when he was on the agenda, and he said that he had reason to believe from intelligence sources that he had that there were so-called black bloc elements within that protest on Saturday night on the Esplanade, and that's why it, the protest was broken up. When I asked him to share what the, you know, the source of that intelligence might be, obviously he said he couldn't tell me. Okay. Um, Mr. Chavary, um, you were in uh, detention for some time. Uh, there seemed to be, uh, we've heard some, some indignities, uh, some evidence of indignities, and I've been written to by other people of women being forced to toilet themselves in front of male guards. Um, one man uh, ha handcuffed behind his back for 16 hours and had to urinate in a cup uh, without the use of his hands. Uh, did you see those events? Um, I'd like to motivate for, for Grayson Lepp to speak on that. Okay, I think sure. he, he actually witnessed um, a Mr. woman. Mr. Lepp, then. Yeah, right. yeah uh, when I first entered the detention center, uh, I was greeted with three large cages to the left and all full of people screaming for water. And on the right-hand side were three port porta potties with the doors removed. Uh, there was a young French girl about 18 years of age on my bus who had to go to the bathroom. She voiced that concern to the police officer. Uh, the police officers then removed her from the bus uh, and took her in front of us to the, to the outhouse in which she had to, with her hands handcuffed behind her back, remove her pants and undergarments and go to the bathroom in front of male officers, female officers, and the rest of the males on the bus. It was, it was absolutely appalling. Also, the, the other incident, um, I ran into an individual uh, in the courthouse eventually, and he had been handcuffed for over about 18 hours, I believe is what he said, uh, behind his back. So uh, when we first got to the detention center, they removed our handcuffs that they had used to parade us in front of the media, replaced them with zap straps in front of us so we could kind of move, and kept us in those till about 11 o'clock at night. He, however, was kept with his zap straps behind his back, put into a, a small cell with no porta potty, a single confinement cell, and was given a styrofoam cup in order to pee in. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much, Mr.